one thing I want to talk about is this 4G to 5G transition. And I'll make this pretty simple. There's a few slides I've got here that we've already talked about. But, um, and I'm trying to make this really, I tried to make this very uh, uh, property tax equipment centric in terms of what's actually got to happen. Because we've spoken today a lot about you know, this release and that release and virtualizing this and upgrading this and doing this. But the reality is what does actually have to happen and what goes where. So there's the reminder bit again on what we're doing here. So we've got the phase one, release 15. Um, that phase two, release 16 and 17. You remember from the panel, you know, phase one is now. 16 is going to be somewhere around mid-20. Um, it may slip still. So it could easily be 2021. And then 17 will be sometime in 2022. So the next few years are pretty well mapped out in terms of what's got to happen and when. The latency piece is obviously comes with that, but also putting in that edge compute which you heard Randy say is happening now, which are small servers wherever they're needed. <laughs> um, the most common place I found that, uh, you know, because everybody asks, where does the edge server go? And the answer is at the edge. And then people say, well, where's the edge? And do you know how you know you're at the edge? If you take one step further, you fall off a cliff. Right? So the answer for the edge is, if your application won't, if you go one step further away, will your application work? The answer is no. You're at the edge. <laughs> right? Simple as that. Um, that we can do by moving stuff around. But the fiber access, we need fiber access to that edge compute. Okay? It could be something, the edge compute could be a Netflix server with content on it. Could be doing image processing or something like this for AR, VR, the amount of traffic going to that edge could be considerable depending on the application. So having a fiber connection to that becomes very important. And that's what you find out is the limitation is, or where people decide to put those is, yes, I can put an edge compute at the bottom of a tower. Does that tower have good fiber, right? Not OK fiber, but good fiber. Um, and that seems to be the, uh, the most common point. Um, I thought I'd show this diagram again because uh, people asked me about it at lunch as well. And it's just I put a lot of work into it. And uh, it took me a long time to get that lot on there, trust me. Um, actually, I've got other slides of drawing all these little pictures. Like, this is my little car, and this is my little truck, and this is my little house. And, and I've got them separately. So I, when I build future presentations, I can keep using them as I need to, you see. So. Future-proof myself. Um, all right, so phase one. So release 15 radios are going in today, OK? So what do we actually have to do to put in release 15, right? So number one, if you're using new spectrum, you're going to need a new radio and a new antenna, right? So T-Mobile is putting in 600 megahertz today. We were doing it last year. They're putting in release 15 radios. But it's new and it's new spectrum. They have not used that before. Okay, new antenna, new radio. Um, uh, Verizon's and AT&T's millimeter wave needs both of those. Okay, so when I you know I joke about Verizon building out two streets in Houston, but you know there are there's other places they're building it out, and we've heard a lot about millimeter wave. As you build it out, you put in a new radio, you put up a new antenna. Simple as that. And obviously, there's a fiber connection to that. If you're reusing existing LTE spectrum, then you need to either put in a new or upgraded radio. So this is how the if or then scenarios come in. So the existing antenna will support 5G as well as 4G band. It doesn't change. Depends how old your antenna is and depends what you're doing. Because you remember in that panel we talked about beam steering and shooting beams with MIMO and all that stuff? If you're doing all that, that's a new antenna. I don't care what technology you're going to use. Okay? So, but if you're keeping it relatively simple, if you've got uh, 700 megahertz with LTE and you want to put in 5G, you can probably just do upgrade the radio, right? If it's a new antenna. Yeah. What about the baseband? Uh, baseband doesn't, I think you can upgrade. Well, actually, um, there comes that second point. So when I say radio on this, it applies to baseband as well. 
So the age of the radio decides if you can up upgrade it. And same with the baseband, right? Um, the vendors tell me <laughs> that if it's less than 18 months old, it's upgradable, OK, with software. That's what they tell me. They tell me that, then in the, same, in the next sentence, they say, oh, yeah, we found 23 big problems with uh, new radio back in September. We've had to change the hardware for. <laughs> so you're like, OK, so you found these problems, but you're telling me you can upgrade it with software. So I'm not convinced that every radio out there under 18 months old is upgradable um, from every vendor. Uh, you probably have to check on that one, depending on the vendor. Um, older than that, if it's older than 18 months, I'll tell you right now, you need a new radio. You probably need a new base. You will need a new baseband to go with it as well. I always think of the two of them as hand in hand. Um, densification, you need more small cells. But that was true of 5G as much as 4G. Um, somebody said today at lunchtime, you know, uh, one of the carriers was putting in 4G cell sites like 150 yards apart. Why would you ever do that? Because they're getting ready for 5G, right? Um, and so uh, that's, densification is the same of 4G as much as 5G. And the limitation there is nothing to do with the technology. It's more to do with um, zoning and licensing and all those things. Um, there's a great example of this. Dallas and Houston just rocking their head with small cells. Dallas, uh, just before Christmas, had 600 requests in for small cells in the city of Dallas. And they were all from different vendors. And <laughs> Dallas said, can you guys put them all in one application, please? <laughs> so they're putting it like one carrier, be putting in like 150. And they said, sure, but you asked us to put them. When we put them all together, you said, can you break them up? Because you have to put them in individually, right? Um, because the old, old things were you'd build one tower here and one tower there, not 50 here, 50 there. Um, but uh, Austin, anybody seen these small cells in Austin? Since you've been here? No? Nobody found them? No? Keep looking. There aren't any. Austin says no. No, not doing that. Because somebody else wants to dig up the street to put in fiber and, you know, our streets are in such fantastic shape down here. They don't, want to, they, want, they don't want to fill in the potholes. Let's keep them, keep them in there. Um, which is really ironic, because we were one of the last cities for Amazon HQ2, because we're hip and trendy and cool, right? We're getting the new Apple campus for $15 billion. We got this new strategic technology command for the US Army, right? Because we're hip and trendy. But no, we're not getting any small cells, because they're ugly. <laughs> That's what they say. So technology image doesn't necessarily mean lots of small cells, right? Um, uh, fiber backhaul is pretty much the same for 5G, uh, for new radio. Um, and uh, Jim was talking earlier. I asked him specifically about strand counts. He said, you know, one gig per sec, uh, one gigabit per second going to a cell site, pretty common today, going up to three and then eventually 10. Um, that's the same as true of Release 14 as of release 15. OK, remember, it's same inter air interface. Same packet core. So all that back end equipment, um, and Randy was talking about virtualization of that, that's all the same. That NSA there in the blue box, non standalone, means it needs the 4G core to hang off of. It uses the control system, is all within the 4G. SA in the red there, means standalone, means 5G has its own core, OK? And that's the new core. So for release 15, same fiber, same packet core, same tower. <laughs> I've had, I was at Wall Street last week, I think, in New York. I did get questions. Do we have to build new towers, like new physical towers for 5G? Because of all the antennas we've got to put up, that the towers wouldn't take the weight. Like, no, we don't. We're OK, you know. Um, all right, so that's, that's release 15. Right, release 16 and 17. We're getting this new core, this fancy new core, which is, is virtualized. Um, there's no real changes to the air link. Uh, remember, we asked AT&T that this morning on the panel, does the air interface change for 16? It may do. There may be some tweaks. 
but nothing's planned really. There's no huge overhaul planned for it right now. Anything that goes in there will probably be things they couldn't get fixed in 15 for whatever reason, okay? Um, but uh, no, so I don't imagine with release 16 we're going to need all new radios and all new antennas. Or anything, nothing like that, okay? We should be pretty safe. Um, our data centers are going to get pretty heavy upgrades. There's something called CORD, C-O-R-D out there, which is the, the best acronym ever, Central Office Reimagined as a Data Center, right? You know that that industry group sat there for a long time to come up with that acronym, not rebuilding data centers, <laughs> rebuilding central office. Um, but that basically says, take your old central office, take all the functionality, put it onto commercial hardware, and distribute it in a virtualized environment. Simple as that. Um, so the data centers are going to get moved, ripped apart, reimagined, but basically distributed. So if your carrier's got a big data center in city X today that is supporting, let's say, four or five states around it, which is not uncommon, that functionality is going to get spread out to all those other states, um, which is going to have implications for you guys. What's that? That's part of the packet, the new core, which incorporates edge compute. Yeah. It's part of the whole, the, it's the one and the same thing. Um, we didn't get into this this morning on that panel with Randy, but um, we do a forecast for uh, infrastructure build. The infrastructure for, small, for edge computes, a couple of hundred million bucks. It's not much because D Dell servers are cheap, <laughs> right? But going into that new core, that 5G core, four and a half billion, right? But I need the, for, the core to do edge and vice versa. So really, you add it all together, you come up closer to like $5 billion of, mo of dollar money going into that thing. That's for the industry in the US. Um, so the, as we said, the vendors, are cho the operators are choosing the vendors right now. Earliest is late 2020, could easily slip into 2021. Um, there's 13 functions in there. Um, uh, I, I had a conversation with at and CTO about this. I said, well, how many vendors are you going to have? He said, well, I could have 13. <laughs> he said, I probably won't do that to myself. Um, we'll end up with two or three. But if one vendor's really good at function number nine, we will use them for that. Um, so it's very specific what these things do. Um, and it gives you all those 5G services that uh, everything's being hyped right now. It gives you that full experience. So you'll have the speed, you have the IoT, and you have that low latency uh, that we talked about. But this one, phase two, is really more around the back-end architecture of 5G versus the towers, the radios, the antennas. Think of it that way. So if you want to put picture it together, phase one is the radio and the, uh, you know, the antenna, the tower, the baseband, the front-end stuff. Phase two is really more of the back-end stuff. So how do we get latency down? Um, we talked about this on the panel, but I thought I'd throw you a few slides in here. Um, it really comes down to locating uh, where the processing takes place. So this is, uh, I said on that panel that it's about 70 milliseconds round trip for LTE. This is how it breaks up. Um, all right, so here's you with your old iPhone. It's like a 3G iPhone or something. Uh, connects up to the radio, fiber down the radio to the cell processing, the baseband, through the backhaul to your local packet core here. So that's the S gateway, the P gateway. So the radio, the radio does its thing. It takes about five milliseconds to actually process, OK? And you know, we said this morning it doesn't really know what you're doing. So it treats uh, a 911 call. No, it's a bad example. It treats uh, an Instagram request from my wife as importantly as a Facebook from my daughter. There you go. And they're not the same. Um, but uh, so there's about five milliseconds in that. Then it goes down here. About another five milliseconds in the baseband, OK? The way to think about baseband and radio is it's a megaphone. The radio is the megaphone. It takes what the baseband is saying and just blasts it out there, OK? The baseband decides if we're speaking English, French, you know, German, Portuguese. Right? It's the language that decides what we're going to speak, OK? In the backhaul, goes through to the packet core, roughly 10 milliseconds. Um, 
The packet core for Austin actually sits in Austin now, but it used to be in Dallas. Um, so it actually take it up there. A lot of cities just have an S gateway. They don't have a P gateway. Uh, the way I always think of it is an S gateway is at the city level. So one city will have an S gateway. The P gateway is at the state level, right? So if, um, if you're doing something that requires just staying in Austin, it'll all be handled here and go off and do something here. If you're going out to the state, you go there and then off into the, the internet. And you can actually, there's hopping off points here if needed, and th oh, this is oversimplified. Then it goes off into the big bag internet, external transport, about four milliseconds for that. And then off into the data center, which will take a couple of milliseconds to actually process. And then it's got to go all the way back, right? So 35 one way, about 35 the other going back, right? So, you know, if you look at this, you go, huh, OK, well, number one, let's move our content from here to there, right? I just moved it. Just got a server and physically moved it and now put you know, the application down here. Now you're actually about 15 milliseconds by the time you've done everything, and then 15 back, so around 30 milliseconds, okay? Now, it's easy just to draw it on a PowerPoint because that's what Slideware is for, to make implementation easy. Uh, it's hard to control this. So how do you decide which applications go down there? Does all of the application reside there? If I, when I move cells, does this application move with me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That's where the complication comes in. But in, in essence, uh, that's, what we di that's what you do. And with no other changes, I can, get, I can halve the latency. Simple as that. Um, really good example of this is uh, actually AT&T. Um, years ago, Netflix, do you remember when you started Netflix at home, you used to have the percentage sign going? It used to take like nine seconds to start streaming, or 9% to start streaming a movie in my house. On, uh, I'm on Time Warner Cable. Um, but on the cell phone, it would go like one, three, nine, get up to about 28, 29%, right? And the reason is the Netflix server was sitting out here. So for my home, it just a straight <laughs> fast, it's easy. But through the carrier, it was all the way down here, through here, around here three times, through there, boom, and all the way back. So it took three times as long. So what uh, Netflix and AT&T did, and they started with AT&T, they did it with the other operators after that, they took a Netflix server and put it down here. And at the time, we had something called net neutrality. Remember that? Yeah? And uh, so net neutrality said AT&T couldn't um, uh, prefer one content provider over another, right? Now we don't worry about things like this. Um, and um, so rather than put the server in the network, AT&T actually leased Netflix floor space in the data center and connectivity. So it was a Netflix server in an AT&T data center. It's kind of a clever. So after that, my request on Netflix would go here and then straight back. And Netflix had this remote server. And they cached a bunch of stuff down there. You know, everything you'd need, like uh, the crown, house of cards, you know, um, et cetera. You seen Bodyguard? Anybody seen Bodyguard? Yeah. yeah, isn't that good? Who's not seen Bodyguard? No, it's a series on, it's British. It's a, um, a, a bodyguard for um, uh, one, a British minister. Yeah, really good. But I will warn you, the guy who plays it, Richard Madden, is Scottish. He's in, um, <laughs> he's in uh, what's that uh, one, the one with the dragons and the magic and stuff? Uh, Game of Thrones, right. But his accent's a bit... Yeah, I'm all right, but my wife's like, okay, I've got no idea what he's talking about. So it is one of those where you have to turn on the subtitles if you're an American. Yeah. Just warning you. Uh, all right, what are we talking about? Right, so we're now down 30 milliseconds, but I've still got three people throwing up at this, right? We're still not down at 10, right? which is the magic number, as you all know. So now what do I do to get to 10 is I start playing games here. So now I start telling my traffic, hey, this is prioritized. This is for an augmented reality thing. You know, we don't want teenagers thrown up in the back of the car. So two milliseconds, and then start doing cell processing down here and steering and prioritization on the baseband, three milliseconds. And some fast servers down here, I can get down to 10 milliseconds. Okay? Yeah? 
Isn't some of this edge computing almost at odds with some of the siting issues? Because small cells, one of the big issue is the photograph of what they go to the zoning commission, or yeah. what small cells are going to look like. It's got these modular antennas at the top, and you're talking about putting a big, fat, ugly box at the bottom of it. Well, don't worry about what we're actually going to build versus what we say we're going to build, Brian. <laughs> Jeez, Brian. <laughs> yes, you are correct. <laughs> Uh, big ugly box, it, this could be a couple of racks, or a couple of units, right? Well, but every, every mock-up yeah. literally just has the slender, yeah, the yeah, yeah. grass slender pole and yeah. antennas at the top. Yeah, with a semi sitting in the back, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they do, don't they? They have these pretty pictures, yeah. That's why everybody complains about them, because what they build is not what they said they were going to build. <laughs> um, semantics. <laughs> Yeah, so this, this point here as well is, you know, I've shown this right at the bottom of a tower. This pole, this radio on a pole, that nice slim, slim pole, right? And then the fiber run, this here, the baseband and the apps could be sitting in like the basement of this building, right? So the pole could be out on the street or even two or three, four or five blocks away. And then the fiber running into here to our processing locally, right? Um, it could be that that simple. It doesn't have to be immediately right next to it. Um, but um, so, um, so that's how we get down to, uh, to 10. So, um, so that was kind of a quick, hey, we've got time for questions, five minutes for questions. Any questions? Anything we talked about today? Anybody confused about 5G still? Less confused, more confused. You're still confused. I, I'm always confused. Okay. <laughs> but going from 15 to 16, right? Yeah. You're saying 16 could be a standalone 5G build out without an LTE base. Yeah. If we go down that road and that's a 2020, yeah. can you give some insight into that and other potential competitors, i.e., DISH? <laughs> okay, so. You're, I'm going to break your question up. Can I build a standalone LTE net, uh, standalone 5G network from 20, late 20 onwards, 2021? Absolutely yes. And this is what the Chinese have been talking about doing. Um, China Mobile, I think, is planning <laughs> to heck with the rest of it. We'll just build a brand new network. The, the Indian companies uh, could, could do that. Uh, I was when I was in Singapore, I was actually met with an Indian data center company. <laughs> it's interesting. They've got data centers, and they've got fiber. And they're going, huh. So if I put some poles on the end of my fiber, <laughs> can't I just build a 5G network? I'm like, yeah. All you need is spectrum. Like, oh, we're talking to the, the government about that already. So late 2020, 2021, like two years from now, absolutely, no questions at all. You, you could talk to vendors today about that. They would happily help you build that. And so there are companies around the world looking to do that. Um, so the other piece of that, now I will answer the second part of your question with Dish. The second part of that question is, can I run this here in a cloud data center, right? So can I put all of this stuff, which has always been on specialized hardware, can I deploy it in an Amazon Web Services data center or Microsoft Cloud? And the answer from the big vendors has always been, oh, no, 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 no. No, we need specialized hardware. It's got to be dedicated hardware to get the response, et cetera. Because a cloud data center doesn't tell you, you get this server. This is yours. It says, you get capacity in this building. I'm going to put it where I need, right? Well, actually, not even in this building. Um, so somebody tried it. They actually took a packet core and actually spun it up on Amazon Web Services, and something absolutely amazing happened. It worked. Probably not something you want to do all the time. I'm not sure you want to guarantee service, but it's something that if you need excess capacity in an area, let's say there's a big football game, and you want excess capacity in that area, well, spin it out on Amazon Web Services, and when it's finished, tear it down. Uh, things like that. Or you're starting a new service area, you're a new carrier who needs to get out fast and has probably promised things to the FCC that you've got to deploy. You could use Amazon Web Services for that until you get your full packet core spun up. Um, 
Dish, uh, anybody from Dish here? Okay, good. Um, anybody from the FCC? <laughs> oh, you can't travel anymore. That's right. Uh, so uh, I saw a presentation from Dish in November, and they scared me to death when they said, we'll have our initial launch in March. And I was thinking, March is pretty good. I was thinking March 19. And then they said, March 2020. I'm like, <gasps> And their, due, their deadline is for a deployment is June, I think, 2020, if I'm not mistaken, right? So they bought all that spectrum, $10 billion worth, and they're required to build out X population coverage with meaningful coverage or meaningful service or something by, I think it is June of 2020. Um, so they're building this IoT network uh, using 10 megahertz slice for a billion bucks, which is not much. Um, the customer for that, I believe, is Amazon Web Services uh, to do that. But if they're pushing it, and I heard last uh, two weeks ago, I was in New York with the Wall Street guys, uh, that Amazon is, uh, sorry, Dish is behind on that build for March launch. And they fired their vendor in California, and they were looking for new tower sites. Um, so it is not going well. So, um, so who's going to, you know, what happens to it? Um, in the old days, when you missed a build-out requirement with the FCC, you go to the FCC, you take a few commissions out for dinner, and then you pay a hefty fine, a few million bucks, and they extended it, and then you carried on building. Because the last thing the FCC wants is Spectrum back from an auction and have to re-auction it, because that's a failure and it takes time. And as Brian just said, he listed off all the auctions that the FCC's got coming. There's a lot of stuff in the pipeline. They don't want to have to deal with DISH. Um, also, it means that that spectrum is tied up if that happens. Nobody else can action it. Um, Verizon needs spectrum for, for LTE. So does Verizon do a deal with DISH? It's been talked about for a long, long time. Uh, the only problem with that is you've got to deal with Charlie Ergen, and he doesn't deal much. So. So what happens with Dish, I don't know. Um, but it's going to be uh, next year, we'll find out. But right now, it's, it's not pretty. Does that answer the question? Yeah. OK. Yeah. When are you going to make a, a you project or anticipate making a presentation like this for 6G? <laughs> I'm 53 years old. I know. You can't believe it, right? Um, I'm 54 next month, a couple of weeks. I'm not sure I get to 6G. This may be my last G. Well, you said that, um, or you suggested that uh, 5G would not become economically yeah. viable yeah. until 2023, 24, yeah. and it doesn't get to be a license to print money until 2027. Yeah. Surely by then, just as has been the case with 4G and 3G and 2G, there will be a... a Six. A, huh? They're roughly every 10 years, right? Roughly. Maybe a bit sooner than that. I think probably mid-decade, next, next decade, we'll be talking 6G. Um, there's talk already about what 6G will be. Uh, Prof Heath talked about it, yeah? yeah? And what's happened... <laughs> Oh yeah, we should have changed the air link. We gotta change. We gotta. We gotta mess with that. Well, the techie geeks are like, yeah, oh, we should have fixed that. You know, I wanna. I wanna. He said, I wanna play changes to the phi, right? And he means the physical layer on the air interface. So that's what they're all talking about. But yeah, I'm not. The short answer is, I'm not planning to be standing here when I'm 60. The, the reason I ask is, the property tax professionals here care a lot about what we call economic obsolescence. Yeah. There's a. Uh, whatever the state of the art is, is our a point of reference. Yes. Um, uh, I, I will tell you, I think there will be a massive pressure with 6G that that and that, and this will be changed, but this will be, uh, so a couple of things. This by 6G is fully virtualized, right? It's just software sitting on hard servers, the core, right? So a 6G core, will just be a new application set, right? New software load. That's easy, right? There will be massive pressure for 6G not to change this and this, and if we do, to make it massively upgradable from 5G version. 
that antenna array will be a big deal in that. Um, so 6G could be this uh, real software upgrade um, that we've always been promised and never seen. But That's great, the software's example. OK, there you go. So I gave you two answers. One, I may be retired by then. And two, it may not be a big deal. Any other questions? Yeah? Would you just go back to the first thing you had this morning about what 5G is not? Would you just? What did, what did I say? I don't know. I, <laughs> I think it was the, this morning. Was oh, it's that, that box up yeah. there, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, that's it. It's pretty clear, look. <laughs> um, <laughs> What did it say? It said not, uh, not just one band. It's not just, there is no 5G band, right? It's not, there's no the 5G band. It's not just millimeter wave, right? It will apply to all the other bands as well. All other bands? Yes. OK, that's. Yes. Everything we have today from 600 gigahertz, 600 megahertz all the way up will be 5G eventually. Not, not tomorrow, eventually. And it'll go up to, they're talking at 60 gig. So we're talking way up there. Oh, thank you. There we go. <laughs> it's in that box. Okay. All right. I'm out of time. Any other questions? Ask Larry.